at um, chapter 5. So let's begin that on page 36. We looked in chapter 4 about the growing connection between religion and farming, and I think that really um, rings true for chapter 5 also. We really see how the two go hand in hand. Because we get this feast of the new yam. So we've got this, this new yam um, festival. And it was held every year just before the harvest. And it's meant to honor both the earth goddess and the ancestral spirits. So there are lots of different um, practices that the community has that are associated with this. So, for instance, they throw out the old yams. They have to start with new ones. There's lots of cleaning, you know, your, your uh, spring cleaning, so to speak, making sure that everyone um, has uh, kind of overhauled their tools and cleaned everything up. And, and there's just a really big community feast. It talks about the amazing quantity of food that's left over. So you get both a sense of the community that's involved um, coming together sharing the food at the table and um, that's really a very happy time meant to be a celebration and it gets specific to a conquo um, a little bit past halfway on page 37 because it says a conquo could never become as enthusiastic over feasts as most people he was always uncomfortable sitting around for days waiting for a feast or getting over it. He would much, uh, he would be very much happier working on his farm. And again, he's very driven by his fear of weakness. And so what makes a man, you know, or what, what best displays a man's strength than hard work? Whereas resting and partying to him just harkens back images of his father, and so he's agitated at all times when he's not working. So there's a lot of this you know, festival going on. He'd already done all the work that he needed to do, and there just wasn't anything for him to do. And so he's very um, agitated on the inside. Of course, the women are very excited because m many of their own families um, are coming. So we need to understand that when a woman marries into this village, she leaves her family behind and she comes to live there. And so for festivals like these, it's exciting for the women to see their relations. And in any case, on page 38, Akankwo is very upset inside. And he is just, there's, you know, bound to be something that's going to set him off. And so he sees the banana tree where, in his mind, you know, someone has been destroying this tree. And it's his second wife who has done something. Her name is Ekwefi. We'll learn that later. But it says that Okonkwo's second wife had merely cut a few leaves off it to wrap some food, and she said so. So that's the first place we see Ekwefi's boldness. And of the three wives, I think she is characterized best because she probably has the strongest connection with him. But theirs is a very um, contentious relationship because Akwefi is not submissive. And so Akankwa beats her um, after this. And we can understand that it's probably... Um, well, I think there's a sense that it's excessive because his other wives, you know, they don't try to interfere, but they do stand off from the distance and say, you know, that's enough, Akankwo. But anyway, after he does that, he decided to go hunting. So he owns an old rusty gun. I think that's very interesting because later in um, the chapter, I'm trying to remember which one it is. I think it's chapter 8. Um, there's a mention of a white man, but no one's ever seen one. And so here we are, 
with an old rusty gun, which is a tool of the white man that, that was brought to Africa, and especially West Africa. So he has, they have the tool, um, the weapon, but they've never seen the man. So I think it's really um, interesting that the weapons arrived before the people. Okay? In any case, Akankwa was a good hunter, or as was not a good hunter, and especially not with his gun. And so when he calls Ikamafuna to get the gun, Akwefi mumbles something about guns that never shoot. In other words, yeah, the gun that you can't do anything with. And so Akankwa heard it, and he's furious, and so he gets the gun, and he literally aims and fires. Actually, I'm not even sure if he aims. Maybe he doesn't realize he needs to do that because it, he doesn't, um, the bullet doesn't hit her. And it says on page 39 that she was on her way trying to climb or scale over the wall around the barn. And she was shook up, but she wasn't hurt, so he missed. And it says, he heaved a heavy sigh. So I think there's a sense that even Okonkwo is, um, I don't know if frightened is the right word, but definitely horrified by his own sense of rage. Okay, there was lots of happiness about the, fe the festival. Um, we see Okonkwo's uh, reverence because he uh, you know, definitely prayed and offered a sacrifice to the ancestors and asked them to protect him and his children and the mothers of his children for this new year. So again, we get another example of, of a people who are um, you know, very much a people of faith, even if their practices are vastly different. Okay, um, the second day starts the wrestling match. And we get another, another story about Equefi, his second wife. And she really uh, looks forward to the wrestling match because it reminds her of the time that she saw Okonkwo. In fact, it, we learned that she was the village beauty. And the first time that, um, you know, she really had feelings for Okonkwo is, is when she saw him in all his glory in that wrestling match where he threw the cat, okay? And we see that she couldn't marry him because he could not afford her bride price. We'll come back to that later. In, in European tradition, there was a dowry which the bride's family had to come up with um, so that they could be married. And in this culture, there's a bride price which the son's family has to come up with to get the bride. Okay, um, then we learn that Akwefi ran away from her husband um, and came to live with Okonkwo. So that opens up this idea for us, or at least it, it brings up a question, what, what happens in a marriage when one partner is unsatisfied? You know, what was what were the rules that govern, um, you know, the, the dissolving of this union? And we don't get an answer to that right here. But it says that she ran away from her husband and came to live with a conquo. And that was many years ago. So now she's 45. Um, but she still really likes the wrestling. And we see her interaction with her daughter, Azima. They have a very unusual relationship. We, we'll see the start of that because Azima calls her mother by her first name. She doesn't call her um, the traditional name for mother. And um, they're excited to go to the wrestling match. And Akankwo likes them as well. He's very much, um, you know, he feels very stirred by the drums and just the raw physical nature of the wrestling match because you know, he really um, connects with that because he values strength and masculinity, or at least that kind of masculinity, 
Um, he, he, he really values that. It says on page 42, uh, towards the bottom, he trembled with desire to conquer and subdue that those um, acts of aggression, conquering and subduing. Uh, so he enjoys the sport for that reason. Okay. And his desire for a woman is also about conquering and subduing. And I don't think that we should treat that as if the author is holding that value up for admiration. I think that there's quite a bit of um, subtle... Um, I don't know what the right word is. Is it emphasis or, um, I don't want to say mocking, but I do think that Achebe tries to point out the flaws in, in certainly in Okonkwo's views of gender roles and that his attitude towards women is also one of aggression. Okay. Um, we learned that one of the um, Okonkwo's daughters has broken a pot and the interesting part of this scene and why it really matters is Ikamafuna's reaction to it because this is um, the younger sister of Nuoya. And we have a sense that she was fooling around with the pot and that's why it broke. It wasn't an entirely innocent situation. She's very upset because she thinks she's going to get in trouble. And so Nuoya tells her that um, what does that happen in the next chapter? Nope, it's this one. On the page 43, Nawoya's younger brothers were about to tell their mother the true story of the accident when Ikamifuna looked at them sternly and they held their peace. So he's very loving towards um, his sister, doesn't want to see her get in trouble, trying to teach you know the younger ones not to rat her out. And, um, you know, he's, he's really kind of a, a leader in that way, trying to teach them, you know, to kind of be united as a group of siblings and not um, trying to undo the other. It's a good story that paints Ikemifuna in a good light, I think. And we see um, Okonkwo's... Um, fondness for Azima on page 44 at the very bottom. But it says that Okonkwo was uh, especially fond of, of Azima. It doesn't exactly say why at this point, except that she looks like, a lot like her mother, who was once the village beauty. And so maybe he's, you know, especially proud that he has this, a beautiful daughter. Um, but he doesn't lavish um, attention on her in this part and certainly not praise because he scolds her and compares her to her sister saying that she has more sense shortly after this. And we also see that daughters are learning a role because it's definitely the woman's job to make the meals for um, the husband and those meals are delivered one at a time into his his hut called his obi by each one of the daughters. Okay. Um, and that's really a good look at chapter 5.